It's week four of our sermon series, Wisdom for the New Year, and today's message is titled, The Good Life. One of the false ideas that has perpetuated about Christianity is that the Christian must live a miserable life on earth, and that to enjoy life this side of the grave is almost an unpardonable sin. God does call us to take up the cross and to follow him, to not make earthly blessings idols inside of our heart, but he also gives us enjoyment here on earth. As much as any book of the Bible, Proverbs addresses the good life. For example, when Solomon addresses his son about marriage faithfulness, in chapter 5 he writes, Drink from your own cistern, running water from your own well. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the life of your youth. Solomon is saying, drink up and enjoy the blessings of marriage. Enjoy life with your spouse. I'm a painter, and I have a bachelor's degree in graphic design. Many art classes and studying famous artists taught me that contrast makes things pop. It makes things stand out. Put something light on a dark background and it makes that light subject matter pop off the page or pop off the canvas. So it is with Proverbs and throughout the Bible. The good life is set on a dark backdrop of foolishness and that makes the good life pop. It helps us understand it, to see it clearly. So Proverbs uses contrasts and comparisons to teach us wisdom. The wise, good, and true, on top of what is foolish, evil, and false. Listen to this from Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper. So that's the dark backdrop. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That's the light. That's wisdom. And notice how we understand the good life more when it's compared with darkness. Solomon teaches two paths in Proverbs, the path of life and the path of death. This is what he writes in Proverbs 10, 17. He who heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. So the wise choose the path of wisdom, discipline, correction, and knowledge And the fools make no room for discipline and knowledge. In fact, they choose the path of death, which leads to destruction. Proverbs chapter 8 and chapter 9, they paint a picture for us. They paint a crossroads. Wisdom and folly both call out to simple people, inviting them to a feast. I raise my voice to all mankind. Both of them cry out. But the Folly path tempts to steal and to be deceitful. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. But wisdom, for whoever finds me, finds life and receives favor from the Lord. That's the good life. So while both paths have food to offer, and the path of folly says stolen water is sweet and food eaten in secret is delicious, how tempting And deceitful that is. It's the path that leads to death. But wisdom is applying the knowledge of God to our daily lives. And that leads to life. The blessing of true wisdom from God is that it doesn't just lead us to the Lord. It carries with it earthly blessings for today. Look at the blessings and benefits listed in Proverbs for your daily life. All associated with wisdom trustworthiness, close friendships, a good reputation, honor, good character, long life, sound sleep. I like that one. Inner peace, peaceful home, humility, success, meaningful work, safety, protection, understanding, knowledge, unity, harmony, and prosperity. That's the good life described in Proverbs. The list goes on. Proverbs 15:24, the path of life leads upward for the wise to keep him from going down to the grave. On the contrary, the fool is described in Proverbs as one whose foolish ways lead to destruction, laziness, 
arrogance, sinfulness, godlessness, a bad reputation, misery, confusion, violence, perversion, wickedness, poor sleep, dissension, and disgrace. As we talk about the good life in Proverbs, keep in mind, even if we follow God's ways, we still live in a sinful world, and we're not guaranteed all of these things that are spoken of in Proverbs. For example, I spoke with a woman who deeply loves God, and it brings her tremendous grief that one of her two children lives a defiant life, rebelling against God. Jesus himself arrived as the wisest man who ever lived, the perfect son of God, and yet he was a man of sorrows. He is wisdom incarnate, and yet he experienced tragedy, loss, and sorrow. Following God doesn't guarantee prosperity or uninterrupted happiness. The prophets in the Old Testament including the ones in the New Testament as well. John the Baptist, the apostles of Christ, and even Jesus himself. They all suffered great persecution for obeying God. Many of us, we also will experience persecution. And while we do, we must remain wise and faithful to the Lord. Many of these people I listed earlier in the Bible, many of them who followed God, they were poor by worldly standards and they give up everything to advance the gospel. So we must not judge someone's faithfulness to God, whether they're living the good life described in Proverbs. Merely basing someone's faith on outward appearance is very dangerous since God looks at the heart. For every Christian, there will be times when we need to sacrifice something worldly for God, and it won't look like the good life. For example, God calls all of us to sacrificially give to him, to put our faith to the test and tithe to God, to honor God with at least 10% of our wealth so that he remains number one in our hearts and we remember where our blessings come from. Proverbs 3, honor God with your wealth, the first fruits of all your crops. God ties the good life to this command. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will bring over with new wine. Even with this promise of barns overflowing, there will be times of disappointment for every Christian. When things happen that we just don't understand, relationships fray, family dysfunction happens, unexpected challenges surface, So while we talk about the good life, keep all of this in perspective, that we live in a sinful world and none of this is guaranteed. Nevertheless, Proverbs describes the blessed life, the good life, the path that leads to life and the path that leads to death. So today, I'll use the acronym LIFE, L-I-F-E, and we'll explore God's plan for the good life with four lessons. The good life begins with listening. Listen. We've talked about the importance of listening already, but what Solomon means is not merely to listen to anything, but to turn your ear to wisdom and then apply that to your life. Proverbs 17.4, A wicked man listens to evil lips. A liar pays attention to a malicious tongue. The wicked man wants to Listen to wicked lips for his own selfish gain. Solomon describes a man who listens to evil friends and joins in their coop to murder and then take the plunder. Solomon then teaches that that person only sets a trap for himself, a trap that leads to death. The wise listen intently to God and heed God's words. Jesus in Luke chapter 9 said this to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand his statement. It was veiled from them so that they could not comprehend it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. They didn't understand what it meant at the time, but they still listened, and they stored it up for themselves and their hearts 
They remembered it so much that they wrote it down for us later, and we have it today. The wise listen to God even when they don't fully understand what he says. Fools, however, ignore God's voice, and they turn their ears away from God. There comes a point when you're so familiar with God's voice that you obey him even if you don't understand how it benefits your life. The discipline to wait and to save yourself for marriage is life-giving since it produces anticipation and future intimacy within God's design of holy marriage. And the person who waits and saves a down payment for a house gains great advantage so she will be able to afford the monthly payments. In the eyes of the world, it doesn't sound beneficial to wait. Go get it now, right? But it is, and it's wise to wait. It's for our own good to listen and to heed God's words of understanding, even when it's different from the way of the world. There's a story about a small group of people who criticized an acquaintance and said, he's unusual, wow, he's different. Finally, one brave person spoke up and said, you know, he is unusual, he is different. I've never heard him speak ill of an absent friend. Listen to God's ways of how to use the tongue and you'll gain a good reputation and someone who is trustworthy and doesn't gossip or slander behind people's back. This also leads to the good life. Proverbs 22 verse 1, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Solomon teaches his son to search for wisdom as a man searches for gold or silver and have ears to accept what God says. Ears to accept God's warnings are more valuable than rubies and gold. For us as Christians, this means we listen to Jesus. We listen to his voice, and his voice becomes part of who we are. Christ said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. You want to reach a point when you're so familiar with Christ's voice that it becomes part of your spirit and you live your life daily in his wisdom. The second step for the good life is improve. Now, Proverbs isn't a self-help book, but it is a book that sanctifies the believer to live a more godly life. Every experience we have in life is a lesson to be learned if we keep our eyes open. A wise person once said, if you don't learn from the past, you are bound to repeat it. Another wise person said, the person who never stops learning never stops living. So are you learning still in life? Are you applying daily lessons that you experience to the future? Leonardo da Vinci was a brilliant man who feverishly journaled lessons and learnings. He draw things that interest him. He had an insatiable curiosity for life. He was so curious and he never stopped learning, never stopped improving. Walter Isaacson in his biography about Leonardo said this was his secret to genius. Thomas Edison, same thing. He took notes on every failed light bulb he created until after 2,774 failed light bulbs, he finally reached a working design for an electric light bulb. Wow! Those failed light bulbs weren't failures at all. Turns out there were lessons to improve. Every day before we sleep, we should ask ourselves, what did I learn today? How can I, with God's help, improve my Christian walk? Lord, I need your teaching about guarding my tongue. And I confess that I need you to guard my tongue even more. Lord, I hear your teaching to love my neighbor. I confess that I have not always loved my neighbor as myself. Lord, I hear your teaching. Forgive me. Today, I ask you to do a good work inside my heart 
to love and serve my neighbor as you have served me. Lord, I hear your teaching to be a godly father, and I confess I need your help. You are the greatest father ever, so shape my heart to be a better father to my children. I want to improve. Discipline, which leads to constant improvement, is so important that Solomon calls it your life. Proverbs 4.13, hold on to instruction, do not let it go, guard it well, for it is your life life. For Christians, when we say improvement, we're specifically talking about sanctification, not justification. Becoming more like Christ every day, that's sanctification. We can't improve to the point where we earn our salvation. We are sinful to the core, and we can't help ourselves when it comes to our standing with God. That's where God, he comes in and helps us. And he regenerates us by the power of the Holy Spirit to trust in Christ's atoning sacrifice for our sins. God did all the improvement work for our salvation. He lifted us up from the slimy pit and he set our feet on solid ground. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit working in us daily repentance. With God's help, we mature and we improve. The Apostle Paul writes about his own maturity. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. There we can see his maturity, progression. And when Christ addresses the seven churches in Revelation, who are already his, these people who already trust in him, he praises them for their strengths, And he also shows them their areas of improvement. All of this so that we are prepared for Christ's glorious return. So he finds us blameless and holy on judgment day. God purifies us. He leads us so that we improve and become more like Jesus. So that's the second step to the good life. And the third step is to forsake. To forsake evil and vices and bad habits. A vice is a bad habit or anything that causes you to be tripped up. Proverbs 4, 14 to 15, Do not set foot on the path of the wicked. Turn from them and go on your way. The lesson here is clear. Don't join in with the wicked. Don't stand, sit, or walk with them at all. Don't dabble in it even a little bit. If we happen to stand in their path by accident or we find ourselves in trouble unknowingly, then we are to get out as fast as possible and to not look back. For example, if you're invited to a party that turns into a drinking bout, have nothing to do with it. It's best to leave. Drugs and illicit sex are rampant today. But God tells us to forsake that kind of lifestyle. Joseph, Jacob's son, in the book of Genesis, literally ran away when tempted to commit adultery with his master's wife. How wise of him to just run, to turn away from darkness. Someone tells us, blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit in it. When tempted to join in evil, we should count our blessings and say what Joseph said. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against the Lord? One of our members texted me a sobering statistic about the decline of Christianity today. And it made me think about this part called forsake. I get a lot of these statistics from people describing how Christianity is in decline. Maybe you get some of these as well. Well, this statistic was interesting because it went back to the year 2007, the year that the iPhone was introduced. The smartphone, which the iPhone made popular, it serves many good purposes today to check the weather, to read the Bible all at your fingertips, to check your bank account balance, to send a text to a friend, all of that right from your fingertips. But according to Pew Research, 
28% of Americans, when asked about what religious affiliation they're part of, answered none. That's up from 18% in 2007. So that number has grown by over 50% in just 16 years. If your phone is an idol in your heart, get rid of it. Forsake it. If it causes you to stumble and watch things you shouldn't, get rid of it. If your account on social media causes you envy and jealousy, get rid of it. Log out. Your faith in God is more important. Christ said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's how serious he is. Another example of forsaking to gain freedom is to forsake drunkenness. An alcoholic must forsake the bottle to walk with God. The bottle has become an idol for him, and he must get the help he needs and then expel that bottle from his life. Whenever we forsake something that causes us to sin, it's difficult at first, but as time goes on, there is freedom. There is release from bondage. There's a noticeable stronghold that's gone. Peace replaces the darkness. And life improves. The good life becomes much more good. And the fourth part of the good life is enjoy. God does not set up certain standards to frustrate us. He doesn't want to frustrate us. He tells us to avoid evil and strive for good. It's for our own well-being and for our own benefit. Family, friends, food, drink, health, possessions. These are all blessings that God may give us for the enjoyment of life here on earth. And they're good. When God created the world, after every day of creation, he said it was good. Very good. So how can we enjoy blessings we have received from the Lord both now and forever? Well, we enjoy them in Christ Jesus. We enjoy them with the Lord. God wants you to enjoy him, to have a relationship with him. I was with a friend one time, and he gave a very generous, unexpected gift to a close Christian friend. The person was so shocked by this gift that they refused it. No, I can't accept this. But my friend, in great wisdom, said, Can you receive God's grace? The person thought long and hard about it and said, Yes, of course, I can receive God's grace. Then my friend said, If you can accept God's amazing grace, which is so enormous, and God's lavished that on you, and it's so much more valuable than any gift you could receive on earth, then certainly you can receive this gift that I'm giving you. The person stopped, smiled, and gave my friend a hug. And that puts it in perspective. You can enjoy life. Don't feel guilty about it, but enjoy it with the Lord. Enjoy it in the context of God first giving you the greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ, for you to enjoy Jesus and to have a relationship with him. God, he loves to give us gifts without guilt. So if you're married, enjoy your marriage. If you're single, enjoy singleness, for Jesus himself chose singleness. If you have children, if you're a parent, enjoy your children. Psalm 127 verse 3, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. And if you work, enjoy your work. Solomon later wrote in Ecclesiastes, Enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This is indeed a gift of God. Ecclesiastes 5, 19. 
So live in contentment. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. The Lord has given you the gift of life through his son Jesus, and it's a gift to be enjoyed. Every day there are opportunities to learn more, to improve, to forsake what is evil, to walk in the ways of the Lord, and God, he fills our hearts with joy. He replaces the strongholds that are released with his gifts, blessings, and a relationship with him that goes on forever. Thanks be to God for his grace, the greatest gift ever given. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it that my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm? What I to love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving sees my comforter, my all in in the love of Christ I stay in Christ alone who took on flesh the fullness of God in him this babe this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin our nail was laid Here in the death of Christ I the world by darkness slain, then burst and forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine. Walk in the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever put me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Morning, Lord of Life Church family. My name is Randy Pauli, and I am one of the seven elders here at Lord of Life. We are so glad that you have joined us online this morning to hear Pastor Matt's series on gaining wisdom. 
We would also be welcoming 17 new members this Sunday to our church family. We have so many blessings to be thankful for in this new year. Let's go to our awesome God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we get prayer requests weekly from our church family, we see that so many members are struggling with health issues or know someone who is dealing with an illness. Please put your healing hand upon these that are suffering and give them comfort. Lord, we lift up the mission of the month, Lutheran Church Charities. Continue to support their ministries of sharing mercy, compassion, and presence through the Comfort Dogs, the Hearts of Mercy, and the Alert Teams that travel to areas that have been hit hard by natural disasters, that they may assist with cleanup and comfort those that have lost so much. Father, we are so thankful for the 17 new members that are being welcomed into our church family this morning. May they feel the welcoming and love that our church family has has for each of them. Continue to bless our church with many new members throughout the new year. Almighty God, help us to not only read about wisdom from your word and hear about it from Pastor Matt's sermon series, but to put it into action by practicing wisdom and discernment in all our actions, words, and deeds. Your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, we should ask for it, and it will be given. Thanks be to God for all these abundant gifts. We ask all these in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.